Um, thank you. Good evening. Um, I will be speaking not German. So um, it's the first time I participated in an all German speaking seminar. And I'm quite impressed because it's almost 7 p.m. and you are still here and you are very attentive. And I'm not so vain as to pretend that you're here to listen to what I speak. I think you are genuinely interested in B and its future potential. So um, I guess I don't know about other centers. Um, I don't know whether the British or the Paris and Luxembourg, they will stay that late for a conference and still be there. But I think even if Frankfurt is a little bit late in this game, they are doing it and they are here to discuss and I hear throughout the forum and thanks to the translator who did a wonderful job. I understand and follow everything. If you have set your mind to understand Raymond B and you have set your mind to become an uh, Raymond B hub and financial center and finance, I think you would do a bad, good job because you are the ones who stay behind and study it. Now, <laughs> I am particularly inspired by um, one of the questioner, a lady in, the pro, uh, in a conference, who asked, what is it for me? I mean, why should I be interested in B? I mean, I, I hear uh, a lot of uh, bankers, um, a lot of uh, sp speaking about the potential, but I think I would bring it back to the basic. Why should I be interested? You have you have heard all day. Why should I, from a corporate point of view, from a small, medium size or large size enterprises, why should I be interested? Those for those people who haven't done business and transacted any business in Renminbi, why should I bother to open an account in Renminbi and 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 to do the trading or to invest or? It's after all the question you have in mind is the currency is still inconvertible. Um, it's, is it worth investing? Would it ever be convertible? Quite a number of questions were asked. What is the timetable? When is it going to be convertible? Is it just another emerging market currency? Quite exotic. Um, and, but for example, yen um, in the 1980s made a big push to internationalize its currency. And now it's only account for 3% of the global reserve currency. You have never you, you, you have never really tra traded in yen or invested in yen-denominated instruments. Why should we care about B? Is this time different? Now, I would set it first up, up start. I will set it out at a strategic level, the vision for the future. China, I've worked with China um, on B is since um, 2004, when we introduced a narrow banking system. I was leading the team to negotiate and, to, to, uh, to, and take it to today, even before um, all this happened. Now, n now China is determined to make renminbi a trade settlement currency, a funding currency, and an investment currency, even before it becomes fully convertible. So there is two track here. One is the objective of the state council, of the leaders, to make B the unit of accounting, the reserve, uh, mainly to facilitate trade and investment. The, another track is the capital account opening. The two are related, reinforcing each other, but we are talking about the, they want, even before they fully open up the account, they want to make B uh, a, a, a currency that you would use to invest and to trade. So that's why they create the offshore center. They start with Hong Kong. They want Frankfurt, they want London, they want competition to build this offshore center, to make Renmin B convertible in the offshore center. But while onshore, they are still subject to, to all the restrictions. But if you build an offshore center in, in Frankfurt, like in the case of Hong Kong, Renmin B is already fully convertible. So it's you, as you, all the bankers here know that you can place an order in Hong Kong for 100 million equivalent of US dollar and buy RMB without moving the market. So it's, it's like, um, 
of course, you have to have a vision. Whether RMB will be eventually fully convertible, you have to have that vision. But then whether it's today they be are fully convertible should not affect your decision of using RMB to settle trade because it's de facto convertible in the offshore center. Now, um, you, you may say, well, I am pretty conservative. I want to know that whether, I want to know when RMB has become fully convertible, then, then I can consider holding it as a reserve current uh, for my investment. So give me a timetable. I'll jump in nearer the time. Now, I think as several speakers already indicated, um, and for all I know, there is no timetable. I mean, of course, I can't speak for them, but there is no timetable. I, this is truly, China is making a series of rapid small steps in opening their capital accounts. And it's not as if they have a big bang approach or they have a roadmap which says that within three years or five years or they would do. But in all my 20 years of experience dealing with the capital account opening, I think well, I have seen most progress, most progress in the last four years than I have seen in the last 20 years. So, but then there is no timetable. And as I said, even eventually, when RMB is fully convertible by the IMF definitions of uh, different buckets of, of, of restrictions, it will not be freely con convertible. Governor Joe two weeks ago in, um, in London has already said it. Now, they are moving from pre-approval to post-reporting practice. So they will try to simplify, simplify and streamline a lot of approval process. But ultimately, there will be macroprudential controls over the convertibility of RMB. So even in the, over the fullest of time, RMB will be fully convertible, but it will not be freely convertible. Whereas in the offshore center, it will be freely convertible. You come to this market, Frankfurt or Hong Kong or London, you will find free convertibility. But if you ask me whether RMB will be a reserve currency, yes, definitely, it will be. It already is. A lot of Asian central banks, a lot of Latin American central banks are already holding RMB as, as diversification. So um, it is moving to be uh, a, a reserve currency, but it will be a long time before it will threaten or, or it will uh, US dollars dominance in this area. So it will be a long, long time. But then the vision that we are seeing is that it will be a more of a multipolar monetary system or the global reserve system. US dollar may not be as dominant as it is today, like taking 60, 70 percent of global reserves. It will be less. And Asia is already the leading light in this direction. The Asian um, currencies, uh, it, it's already, the central banks are clearly moving in a direction of diversification. So you, you're talking about a, uh, a vision in, in which there will be multipolar monetary system. And whether you like it or not, RMB will have an important part to play in this multipolar world. And at that time, you won't be asking what you're asking today, that whether we should deal in renminbi, because you won't ask whether we'll deal in pound sterlings or euro, or because it is going to be part of the system. So this is, um, uh, this is the future. This is the future, and this at least justify why you are still here trying to understand the, the importance of the future of this renminbi. Now, I still haven't answered your question. Why should you be interested? Why should Frankfurt be interested at all? Um, is it because you want to build uh, Frankfurt into an offshore RMB hub to compete with London, Luxembourg, Paris, for that matter? No, I wouldn't say that this is your primary objective. Because Frankfurt, Germany, is the, your comparative advantage is in real economy is in your being the largest trading partner, being a very important investment market for China. So your competitive edge is actually building the economy. And, and it would be nice to be developed into a hub, um, into, into the 
the renminbi center, but I would say at least um, you, you, and you do stand a better chance because your real business is, is between China and Germany. It's not between China. And it, you are the largest market here for China. So, and as I said earlier on, China's objective is not to build, is not to have the renminbi uh, capital products all over the world. It's not. Their purpose is, as you recall, when and why they, 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 they announced the renminbi cross-border uh, cross settlement. It was after the 2009, um, it was after the global crisis in 2008. Um, the first announcement is in 2009, the State Council made the decision to allow uh, uh, renminbi to be used to denominate an invoice and settle cross-border trade. It was clearly a response to the US dollar and the volatility. So, it, of course, they didn't say so, but then there was clearly a response that we need to diversify away from a dominant currency. So, because China's focus is to facilitate trade and investment, and because Germany's advantage over other cities and other centers is in, in the real economy, so I do think that there is a good potential for development. I'm surprised that it's not already in the lead. Now, I would give you a um, data example. I mean, Asia being closer to China, being very comfortable with the use of renminbi is ahead of you. But then I would give you a data example. I'm actually based in Paris right now. So, and this is the season for, um, of course, the shops that go on steep sales and discounts. And so I was shopping. <laughs> and then there was this group of um, tourists, Chinese tourists, ahead of me in the queue, in the payment, in the cashier. And they were first, they, they would have bags of, uh, of the um, Gucci's and handbags, and, and they were trying to pay for it using their credit card. And of course, they used Union Pay, which is not Visa, not Master. And, uh, and this department store does not accept Union Pay. Okay. So they take out renminbi cash and do. There's no way that they can convert their renminbi into, into euro to get it paid. Now, so then they walked away. So I guess they are so used to shopping in Hong Kong using renminbi cash or using their credit card. Not only Hong Kong, Japan, and Korea, if you go there, then renminbi is basically convertible. And the East Chinese tourists actually believe that renminbi travels very well globally. <laughs> well, I guess the mighty uh, tourist, uh, Chinese tourist spending power is changing the retail outlets in Hong Kong and elsewhere, but it hasn't arrived in Europe, not, not in Paris yet, and I doubt whether Frankfurt can actually over that. This is just a daily story. It's the same in the wholesale level, in the corporate level. If a Chinese buyer with a pricing power are indicating a preference to invoice and settle in renminbi, you should ask yourself whether you and your banker are ready to do it. Or if a prospective investor is, is tying up with a German engineering company to explore mining in Latin America and uh, be, know that Latin America renminbi is actually the most frequently traded currency. So, and they, and they got financing from China Development Bank in renminbi. So I, and then they're ready to use, that, to use this product to procure um, equipment from China. So are you ready to get into it? I mean, is your, is your accounting system, is your bank uh, ready to, to handle this? We've heard um, from the panel, Huawei and Kion Company. Huawei is a good example. If, if the, the Chinese multinational is going to invest in Germany, it would find it very welcome if in Frankfurt they can actually manage their exposure to Euro and renminbi through the center, rather than in Hong Kong, which they are doing now. They set up companies and they, they do their treasury operations in Hong Kong. And as um, that gentleman was saying, that they can do it in the Frankfurt time zone to hatch or to, to hatch their exposure to, to, to Euro. They don't have to wait till Asia wakes up and do it in Hong Kong. So, and, and because of these 
these Chinese companies have a lot of natural, um, because of the, this is a big investment market for them. So this itself are the reasons why Frankfurt and its financial institutions should be all conversant of, um, in the use of RMB. And that was the reason why back in 2004, in, at, when I was working at the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, we know that there wasn't a lot of traffic, um, a lot of business in RMB, but we started and built this RMB payment system and, and, and waiting for that traffic to happen. So this is important thing is to have the, 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 the banking sector all geared towards it. Now, um, there is on the capital market, on the funding, RMB as a funding currency. Now, I, I think you're familiar with it. Um, KFW has already explained. Um, they, and, and multinational companies like Volkswagen has already issued them some bonds. Now, I, in my um, Hong Kong, the dim sum bond market outstanding is still growing rapidly. So there is notwithstanding the, the RMB appreciation or depreciation trend, um, there are still a lot of dim sum bonds issued. I have taken a close look because I was uh, actually working to bring that market about. And I do see that the real issuers um, were actually European companies. Because unlike, there's not a lot of American here, unlike the American companies, the European companies take a longer term horizon. And they would like to match their, their funding needs with their future revenues in renminbi. So if, if they are raising funds in renminbi, then they don't, it's regardless of whether renminbi will appreciate or depreciate, then they will bring this currency uh, bring the, fund, the, the proceeds to fund their investment or capital on the mainland, and then the returns coming from it will pay for it. So they just take a, longer, a neutral uh, position on RMB. Whereas a lot of firms are not doing it because they were expecting RMB to appreciate. So they rather bring in US dollar, which is cheap anyway. They bring in US dollar and then confer it in RMB and waiting even before their investment and waiting for it to appreciate and generate a currency return. Now, this is fine. I mean, for companies, um, of course, the cost of funding is the most important determinant of whether you are issuing it in renminbi or not. And there are times where the hedging, I mean, you, you probably don't hatch because it, it would, the cost of it will be very high. So I'm saying that these are what I see as um, the reasons for, for, for it. Now, the, the, the third part I would talk is Hong Kong's experience in building up and what what are the perspectives for Frankfurt? Now, Hong Kong by far has the largest pool of renminbi deposits. It's close to a trillion yuan um, uh, now. And in terms of payment turnover, our system is actually capturing 70 to 80% of that turnover. The CNH market is fully convertible and fully freely accessible, just like the euro or the US dollar. And the, the, it was from ground zero, zero, it has grown to a daily turnover of around 20 to 30 billion US dollar equivalent. Now this is, of course, 20 to 30 billion daily turnover is nothing compared to the trillion dollar US dollar market, but it's quite something from zero. And, and, and what I'm talking about, and spot and forward are half and half, so spot forward swaps we do have a suite of products which would uh, allow some form of hedging if, if needed. Now, it's not sometimes, of course, the liquidity is not that great, but then it's, it's the beginning. Now, how do we get there and, and would Frankfurt able to replicate it? The key, the very, I would like to echo what I said earlier. It's, all rooted in real economy. The, the, power, the, 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 the sharp increase in renminbi deposits are all, most of them, due to trade, due to trade settlement in renminbi, particularly in the first few years. Why? How else? I mean, if you think of the onshore and the offshore market, the Chinese is still keeping a um, 
uh, uh, capital controls. So the, um, the offshore market is something like a reservoir. And when they open up the floodgates a bit, the water will flow out. And then that's where, where the, when, when it flows out in Hong Kong, it's freely, freely circulating and freely, freely um, convertible. Now the floodgates, I mean, how, what, un, under what circumstances would women be flow out? It's mainly trade, actually. Whatever we, the churning that we are doing is not increasing the amount of water. So what you really need to build up your market is to work on to promote trade. Now, and that gets to the question of, um, of, of, of that lady. What, what are you doing to help them? How, how did it get started in Hong Kong? What, why would a SME in Hong Kong, well, we are also a lot of SMEs, not just big corporates. What, what, what initiated it and why would they turn, use renminbi? Now, I, I think for the water to flow out, is, that means that there is a more inflow into Hong Kong than back to China because trade settlement is both way. So in the first year, if you, I looked back at the statistics, it's like um, $5 flowing out and $1 going in. So we have a net gain. Now, of course, the appreciation trend of RMB is helps a lot. I mean, if it's depreciating, why? I'm, I have no incentive at all to be holding this currency. But in, other than that, um, and, and the pointing factor is competition among the banks to compete for a slice of that business. The HSBCs and, and Standard Chartered and Bank of East Asia were competing to position themselves as the renminbi bank in trade settlement. And so I learned for every dollar business that they are doing, they are actually losing money because they would try to get the market share from the mainland or from the mainland, they, they're not listening to their central government and so they all use remedy. It's no, it's just, it's still market incentives. So they would have to offer very good terms of financing. They would, they would rather to induce or to, to incentivize their clients, whether it's in Hong Kong or the mainland, to be using renminbi to, to settle rather than use US dollar or Hong Kong dollar. So, um, this is, and, and, and this is certainly not the Hong Kong government or the Treasury or the HKMA, the central bank telling the banks to do this. That's because they see that they have um, a market incentive to position themselves well in, this, in, the, prom, uh, in the promising business in the future. And um, truly, in a few years' time, I already know that renminbi business has become a driving force in their profits. So it does pay off. But as with a lot of things, investing in China doesn't pay for a long time, as we all know. So, so the key, as I said, is in having this pool of liquidity in Hong Kong, um, in, in, in Frankfurt, for, for, for your, in this connection. And then when you have this pool of liquidity, then when I was doing it, and the question we asked is, the, 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 the bankers or the other would say, what am I going to do with renminbi? It's only earning 0.6% interest rates on deposits. So it's not going to be very attractive. And, and for, for traders, for, for, for example, I mean, they, they don't want idle money to be sitting in the bank. So that's why we asked for flow back. So we asked for that to use the renminbi to assess the mainland securities market, the fixed income, the interbank bond market, the fixed income, and now um, the RQ fee that you have. So in a way, Frankfurt, London benefited from us because we, you have it in one goal. You actually already have it. You have the entire, with this morning's and the announcement, you have the entire suite of things that we took us three or four years to build up one piece by one piece. So the, um, but it was important to notice that you, you, you still have to service the real, in, real economy first before that people will start um, uh, considering what to do with the renminbi that they have in their hands. 
Now, and, and that was the, um, the, the second stage of developing the, uh, our QV market. And just now there was a lot of questions asking whether 80 billion is sufficient. And we started with 50 billion um, and it was quickly used up. And then we asked for more. It was promptly given to us. And now we have 280 billion or, or 28 billion rather. Um, uh, no, so 280 billion. So, and we have not exhausted it yet. So the supply of quota is more than the demand, to put it that way. So don't worry about it. <laughs> if you can use up all of it, I'm sure they will be very happy to provide more. But I think it's important, as in these cases, whether you have the demand for these products. Hong Kong market is very different. We, whether it's a stock market or this market, we always have a huge and big retail presence. The RQ fee, um, it has the retail portion and the, and, and the institutional portion. The retail portion was extremely successful. Um, there were four or five um, ETF which were listed on our stock exchange which tracks um, A shares. And they used these quotas to form it. And, 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 and basically, in, instantly, they become this, the largest or the second largest, rather the second largest um, uh, ETF traded on our market, and we are a big market for ETFs. And that's because they actually, it's not synthetics. The ETFs, because they have quota, they actually buy and track the A shares. And, uh, and because we have a huge um, retail presence in our market, but the same may not be true here. But what I'm saying is we have institutional portion, but the retail portion is also big. And we also, Basically, now in terms of RMB as an investment currency, we have the entire suite of products from ETFs, which I talked about, mutual funds, fixed income funds. We have life insurance contracts in RMB, uh, which is paid in RMB and paid out in RMB. So um, it's 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 um, I, I that the, the the development path may be different, but then. Um, when I looked at the dim sum bond market, the dim sum bond market is all institutional. And there's a huge demand, at least among Asian uh, pension funds, for those, um, for those uh, renminbi bonds. So I think, it's, it's, I think it is going to catch up in Europe, but um, look at what the, 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 the way it's developed in Asia will give you some idea of what is going to come. Last part, why it's, it's why, why would the government, the federal government or the regional government be involved in the promotion of RMB? I think I remember one question from the audience is like, oh, are you believe um, which currency to denominate your trade or your investment is basically a um, decision by the market, by the investors. So why, would, why is there a need for the government to be involved? Um, I have been asking that question. Hong Kong is a totally free market, laissez-faire. The government doesn't want to be involved in any business decision or drive any business. But we have been in a driving force because this renminbi is still an inconvertible currency. You need to negotiate quotas. Um, I don't think that uh, Bank of China or HSBC going to them asking for quotas would be listened to. So. As the government, um, that is the view that we take, is that we need to build this infrastructure, we need to build this platform as an option for, for the industry to consider whether they would like to invest in. Um, it's just like you need to build a stock exchange and you, you, you need to have this policy in place so that investors can decide for themselves whether they would use renminbi or euro or um, or, or other currency. So, and as we all know, that each time you get a policy, it's when your chancellor is visiting in, in Beijing. So to them, to the Chinese, it's pretty uh, clear that this is a government to government level uh, decision and allocations. And, and they um, are, are and so that's a good reason why the government and uh, should be involved. Now, as to the pace of development, how quickly can you develop? I mean, what are the determinants for this to develop further? 
First and foremost, it's always China's own pace in liberalizing its capital markets. Um, if it doesn't, uh, um, I think um, Madame Zhang the, uh, from PBOC was saying, an important development is the mutual assets of the stock exchange. That is, mainland Chinese investors can buy through their Shanghai Stock Exchange buy into the Hong Kong equities. And international investors, wherever they are, can buy into, through the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, buy into the Asia's. And they are done in renminbi. Because we want, we want the flow, we want more flow out in renminbi. And so when we design this mutual, mutual assets of renminbi, uh, of the stock exchange, we design it, it can be done in renminbi. Now, um, this is, it, that's why I, I'm saying that they agree to this pilot, and they agree to give us a quota for this pilot, is a sign of liberalization. And more of this pilot, this is another reason why you should be in, listen and put renminbi on a radar screen is, the liberalization of the capital accounts will be done, they will be more comfortable done in renminbi than in, US, than, than in, in US dollar or other currencies. You see it in the Shanghai Free Trade Zone, which came out several times today. Um, if you look into the detailed rules, you will notice that they are more comfortable allowing offshore renminbi loans to be, to be uh, brought onshore and not US dollar loans. So there is the, 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 the way forward for liberalization of capital markets is renminbi. Um, and you can tell from the RQ fee quotas and the restrictions, I think those of you um, um, who are involved know that the RQ fee, the restrict, the, 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 it's a lot more relaxed than the US dollar Q fee in terms of bringing capital and repatriating the capital. So relaxed that you can do a ETF. So you can tell that it's like daily, they allow daily redemption in renminbi, but they will not allow daily redemption in US dollar, not yet at least. Now the first and foremost, as I said, on the pace of development is, is the liberalization of account. The second is what I said, you, you need to have the infrastructure in place. Um, Bundesbank is very good in this, trying to set up and, and, and prodding this process along with Bank of China to have this infrastructure. But by infrastructure, it's not just hardware infrastructure, but software, like fixing, like um, um, uh, the, uh, we, we in, in Hong Kong, it took us quite a long time uh, because of the LIBOR thing that, 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 that we took us a long time to, to work on this fixing for the renminbi loan, the daily fixing for the lending in renminbi, which is very important benchmark because renminbi funding is going up, the, uh, it's, it's, it's increasing. So this is a whole set of infrastructure and policy initiatives that needs to be in in place, the quotas needs to be negotiated, it needs to be renewed. Um, the, the, the last important point is market awareness, and this is why we are here today, is to raise awareness in the market to, to um, without the market, without the demand for it, there is no need, there is actually no point in discussing how to make Frankfurt a center. So the market has to be aware of it. The intermediaries, that is the banks, the lawyers, and has to be equipped to handle this. And, 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 and we're, we're just very lucky in Hong Kong that we were there early. But it doesn't, it, in, and if you ask me why China would give a clearing system a center to Frankfurt and give one to London and then, and then in Luxembourg and Paris, in addition, in Hong Kong uh, already, we in Hong Kong were already, of course, in the very early on, we're saying that oh, we can be the hub of the world. You don't need all these centers. But then we lost that battle a long time ago when, when Singapore got it and Taiwan got it. Um, I think they are very smart. They are, they are very smart because it's, as I said, it's in their interest to encourage trading as much trading at it, 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 and the use of renminbi in each and every market. The financial centers, or the uh, aspiring to be financial centers. And it's certainly, in the end, up to the market to decide which one will be hub. So it's, a, it's, a, it's like firing line, um, they're already fired. Now, now, now everybody is in a different starting 
starting line, but they are not more or less, it's from zero. Uh, we are a little bit um, lucky because we are two or three years ahead. But then um, I think there is still, uh, as a lot of commentators just today have said, there is, renminbi trade settlement is now 14% of its total trade already. So it has, in, in just four years, it has a lot of potential to grow into 20% and more. And renminbi as an as a investing currency is also increasing. So there is so much room, a lot of room for it to grow. So even if you are one month to one year ahead or behind, I think there is still a lot of room in which Frankfurt can grow into a real financial center with, the, as with your real economy and links with China to be the gateway or the hub in the West. I have to still um, retain Hong Kong is still the hub in our part of the time zone. So thank you very much.